Good morning, everyone. Happy winter solstice. All right, hum, um, let me see. I don't want to embarrass anyone or call anyone out. Would you, would you like me to, to explain what a winter solstice is, or does everyone pretty much have a clear idea? Yeah. So the winter solstice is the, uh, um, you know, the earth is tilted at about 23 and a half degrees on its axis. And as it moves around the sun, that makes the sun appear to slowly move from north to south and back again over the course of a year. As the sun is here and the earth sometimes points the northern hemisphere towards it and sometimes points the northern hemisphere away from the sun. The winter solstice is that point when the sun reaches the furthest point south. So it's when we're directly pointed away from the sun. <laughs> And it also happens to be the shortest daylight of the year from here on out. Uh, we're climbing back uphill towards the summer solstice when we'll go downhill again. <coughs> so that's what the solstice is. That's today. The, it happens at a particular time during the day. And I don't recall what that time is. Something like... Uh, 323 Eastern. Thank you very much. And means pause or stand still. So sol Sun still. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome to Science Sunday. As I anticipated, the turnout is relatively light today. I've got one more person to add. There we go. This is, uh, this is deceptively similar to Father Christmas. Um, actually, this is Leonardo da Vinci. I have... <coughs> I have, re I have several science action figures, and uh, Leonardo will be joining us today. Uh, yeah, he's fully, well, not fully articulated, but, but largely articulated. He's pretty excited to be here today. All right. Um, so today, last couple months, last couple talks, I've talked about mathematics. Um, today, we're going to talk about measuring reality. And this will be a prelude to a couple of talks that will be coming up in the uh, subsequent months. We're going to talk about relativity. We're going to talk about quantum mechanics. We're going to talk about symmetry theories and particle physics. So it gets really, um, really exciting from here on out. This is the uh, bon voyage. This is the departure from the dock. So um, when we talk about measurement, because many of these advances in science that we're going to be talking about in the spring and in subsequent months are derived directly from interesting measurements that were made about how does the world really work. When I was talking about the, uh, the Big Bang, the subtext to that discussion of the Big Bang was about how science surprises us time and again. If you look up at the night sky, you have perhaps no reason to believe that that sky is in any way changing or dynamic. The stars are the same today as they were in your great-great-grandfather's or grandmother's time. So the story of the Big Bang and the story of our understanding of the universe is constantly revised as we find more information. And that information comes to us by virtue of measurement. So today we'll talk about some of that um, process of measurement. So the first and easiest thing that you can do to measure, oh, um, as a prelude, I forgot uh, announcements. We got a couple minutes. Um, thanks to the humanists of West Suburban Chicago Land, um, under whose auspices this program is presented, as well as jointly by virtue of the the facilities and the gracious support from the DuPage Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, the DUUC is a member chapter of the American Humanist Association. Uh, it's one of the few Unitarian churches that is explicitly a member of the humanist organization. And uh, humanism espouses uh, a naturalistic philosophy, an ethical worldview, and a scientific um, mechanism for understanding and working within the world. Um, those of you who are curious, I, uh, I welcome you today uh, to this free program. 
And if you're interested in the humanists or in the church, um, there are many people around that can provide you further information. Uh, we've got other programs coming up. Um, we just finished the humanists human light holiday celebration a week or so ago. And coming up uh, in the second week of January on a Wednesday evening will be our, our January program. And at the moment it escapes me what our program is. Stephanie, do you recall? Okay. And then uh, second Friday is your Just Views um, film. Okay. So um, lots of things going on that may be of interest to those of you who are um, uh, who find some affinity with humanism. So anyway, back to uh, measuring the universe, direct measurement. This is the way that we interact with the world. This is the way that we know not to run into walls. It's the way we know how to catch a ball. The way that we can see a flower is through direct human senses. We know about five canonical senses. You know, you learn this in elementary school. Um, but the human body has many more than just five senses. We can also sense our orientation. We can sense temperature. Um, we can sense pressure. There are many different aspects to our senses that are not <coughs> covered just by these, uh, these five touch um, uh, so that's the more there, pressure, temperature, time. We have a built-in sense of time and orientation. Uh, these are called homunculi or singular homunculus. And these are two homunculi. Um, the first one is if you were to make the pieces of the body a size proportional to how um, relevant they were to our senses, this is what the body would look like. So we get a lot of our information through our hands, almost nothing through our kneecaps. Um, we get a lot of information through our mouths and our eyes and our ears. Um, on the other hand, controlling our body, this is the amount of neural machinery dedicated to controlling our body. The hands are once again large. You'll see that the ears are absent. There may be a few people who can wiggle their ears, but largely uh, they're free of motor control. Um, so these are two different representations of how our senses and how our motility is enabled by virtue of the control of our brain. And for many centuries, this kind of direct um, apprehension or witnessing of the world around us through our senses was uh, a limiting factor. What is measurement? Well, as you look at the world, I, I, I like to use the word apprehend. You can apprehend the world. As you apprehend the world, you can see things that are near and things that are far. But recognizing what separates these, what is that distance, how can we measure it, sometimes is challenging to the direct human senses. Right? It's probably clear if we watch the moon long enough, if we were actually in uh, Paris, that uh, by virtue of perspective, we could see that the moon was further away than the Eiffel Tower. But how much further away? These questions of being able to quantify our measurement are also important, and we talked a little bit about that um, over the prior lectures with regards to mathematics. Do we always agree on measurement? Is something too hot or too cold? Right? Uh, there's a subjective element to understanding what our senses are telling us about the world. Uh, is something 500 feet away or is it 200 yards away? We can develop an innate sense of distances and physical phenomena that relate, that relate to the human scale. We can get, if we are accustomed to driving or interacting with the world, we may get some sense that uh, this is 200 yards away or so. Um, but we have no intuitive sense how far away the stars are, how far away the sun or the moon are. How fast is something moving? If you're standing in front of a truck, you'd better be pretty good at judging how quickly it's moving towards you. So this innate ability to judge change, to judge motion, is something that we're also equipped to do naturally. Uh, objective versus subjective measurement. I talked about that a little bit with regards to the hot and cold. In terms of objective measurement, we can begin to quantify measurement. We can develop scales, 
We can develop devices. We can develop mechanisms. We can use the symbology of mathematics where we represent one thing by another thing. In this case, we can represent a distance by a number or a weight by a different kind of number. And then we've got this idea of relativity. If you um, are in an airplane standing in the aisle and you throw a ball up and let's say uh, you're in a smooth airplane, there's no turbulence, you throw that ball up, it comes right back down to your hand, just as if you were standing still on the ground. However, um, if somebody were looking through a window to see you do this, they're standing on the ground, they see you flying by in an airplane, what they see is that you throw that ball up and it has a much longer trip to get from one hand back to your hand as you throw, toss it up and down. So this notion of uh, different people see different path links for this journey. How can that be? How can two different people measure two different things? Well, in some sense, what we apprehend about the world is relative to how we exist in that world and relative to other objects in that world. And then speaking of relative, um, there's the theory of relativity, which I believe Einstein wanted to call the theory of invariance rather than the theory of relativity. Um, there's a similar experiment you can do. Here's an astronaut standing in a rocket ship and he bounces a laser beam off of a mirror on the ceiling and down to a detector on the floor and uh, that's what he sees. He could do that while the rocket ship is at rest or he could do that while the rocket ship is flying through space. Well. If you happen to be in a rocket ship moving differently than this one, or uh, perhaps it's stationary and you look through a portal in the rocket ship, you would see the beam of light going up to the mirror on the ceiling and coming back to the detector on the floor. Well, clearly these two paths, if you add up the distance traveled by this light beam here and here, um, they seem quite different. We're going to talk next time in January, we're going to talk about relativity specifically Einstein's theory of relativity and what the implications of this specific kind of measurement, particularly regarding light as opposed to a ball that's tossed up and caught, what that means in terms of the way reality works. Fundamental properties. Uh, distance, right? You can fairly directly comprehend what distance means when you apprehend when you witness or experience something that takes uh, spatial extent into account, then distance is a pretty direct concept. The net, oh, I'm sorry, this is a llama left over from the math talk. <laughs> um, orientation, right? You, we can use a compass, we can use headings, we can use many other things to figure out how are we oriented with regards to other things around us. Uh, how are we oriented with regards to the stars? That has something to do with the winter solstice. How are we oriented with regards to um, the streets that surround this particular building? So orientation is another very basic aspect of measuring reality. Uh, duration, time intervals, there are different ways to measure durations. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Um, <clears throat> linear motion. So there are different ways to measure and uh, quantify motion. Rotational motion. Someday, perhaps, we will have one of these spinning space stations that will impart artificial gravity to the uh, astronauts who are fortunate <laughs> enough to be up there. Um, acceleration. Acceleration is another fundamental property of, um, of our universe. Um, here are some, uh, some people experiencing acceleration in a rather surprising way. Mass and energy are also basic aspects of our reality. There are different ways to measure them. And then uh, interactions. It's pretty clear that there is stuff around us, that there are uh, objects and phenomena that we are able to apprehend. But why is it? I mean, if you think about it at a deep level, why is it that we know about things that are not us? All of that information comes to us by virtue of some kind of interaction between us and the environment. And at a more basic level, those interactions are described by a very small, literally a handful 
of interactions in basic science. We are familiar with the interaction of gravity, but the feeling of pressure on our legs or our feet, the feeling of pressure arises from electromagnetic phenomena, similar to the phenomena that's uh, driving the hairs apart from this girl's head. So electromagnetism and gravity are two of the interactions that are the most important for our mechanisms for understanding, for apprehending, for witnessing, and interacting with the world around us. There are a couple of others, and we'll talk about those um, in subsequent uh, discussions. So there are some derived properties. I talked about the fundamental properties, mass, energy, length, time. There are derived properties, density. What weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? Right? Well, they both weigh the same, but they have very different densities, and they'll react differently because of those different densities. Density is a derived property that combines the idea of distance in the form of volume and mass in the form of uh, weight. Temperature. Um, temperature is, in some fundamental sense, a derived quantity. It measures the amount of energy in a particular system. If that system is comprised of millions or billions of molecules, then the temperature is the statistical measure of the aggregate motion of those molecules. If it's, uh, if it's light, the temperature measures directly the energy of that light. Elasticity. Um, those of you who have ever been bungee jumping um, are uh, very highly dependent for your safety on the existence of elasticity. If there were no such thing, then if this were a very uh, taut rope or, or let's say a steel cable, then, uh, well, it wouldn't end well. Um, probably almost literally tear you in half when you jumped off a bridge. So elasticity is a property that's derived from the interactions of electromagnetism. Who would think that electromagnetism had anything to do with bungee jumping? But to a physicist, at a very deep level, anytime you measure many of the aggregate or bulk properties of a material, you're measuring a statistical characteristic that derives from one of these fundamental interactions. Same thing with viscosity, the thickness of honey compared to water. That's because of uh, molecular <coughs> electrical interactions. The refractive index of a material. Different spheres made of different material refract light differently. And the reason why those kinds of refractive indexes vary is because of very fundamental differences in the electromagnetic properties of the material. Entropy. Um, this is, a, this is a subject that's very dear to my heart, not the messy clean room thing, although that may be relevant. Um, but uh, entropy is a very slippery topic to try and discuss. I don't have a separate lecture about it uh, this year, but uh, maybe someday we'll, we'll uh, talk about it specifically. But entropy, in, in a very fundamental sense, is a derived property. It has to do with the number of states or um, ways that a thing can be arranged and be indistinguishable from the way it is arranged. That's one way of defining entropy. So the neat versus the messy room. <coughs> um, <coughs> pardon me, melting, boiling, freezing points, etc. Uh, again, a bulk property of many materials. These are derived from innate chemical properties, which are again derived from typically electromagnetic phenomena. Money. One of the lectures next year will be uh, some of the basics of economics. Well, money as a mechanism for ascribing value to something, including our work or our efforts or our, our human output or the value of a particular good, these are derived properties uh, derived from the chemical nature or the lower versus higher entropy. Food is more valuable than waste because food has a much lower entropy than waste, but it's the same mass, right? it's the same, end pro uh, same molecules, but they're rearranged differently. So we value a lack of entropy, and we're willing to put a numeric value to that in terms of money. Let's talk a little bit about natural units. <clears throat> just, yeah. I just want to make sure I understand. So the two basic states you're talking about are derived and innate, right? Right. Okay, so then fewer innate. M many fewer. Okay. 
Yeah, uh, innate things like um, um, electric charge, mass, distance, time, um, and there are a couple of other charges associated with other forces of nature. And then nearly everything else we know, color, density, temperature, viscosity, elasticity, value, almost all of those, um, or all of those that I mentioned are derived from some combination of those. <clears throat> so let's talk about units and natural units. If we were to communicate out into the stars, and let's say that I wanted to uh, send a radio signal towards Proxima Centauri that told them what the speed of light was that we measure here on Earth. Well, maybe I could find a way to convince them that I'm talking about the decimal system so that I could convey these numbers al almost literally or maybe I could convey these numbers in binary. But then I could say, well, the speed of light is 186,282 point something miles per second. And then when the beings that may be on Alpha Centauri receive my message, they would perhaps be able to translate this number. But what's a mile? What's a second? Our second is an accident of history, what we denote as a second. What we denote as a mile is similarly an accident of history. Is there a way that we can talk about nature that gets rid of these historical accidents? Is there some natural system of measurement that nature applies that we could agree on universally across cultures, across space and time, perhaps in between the stars? Well, what we can do is we can set, we can define the velocity of light or the speed of light, equal identically to the number one. So one is the speed of light. And every other motion that we, vis uh, that, we, that we experience in the universe is some fraction of the speed of light. And now things begin to make some sense, right? When I'm talking about moving at uh, a, a, a thousand miles an hour or a thousand <coughs> miles a second, I'm point oh 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 five percent of the speed of light or so, something like that right so you can talk about how fast are you moving with respect to the speed of light and that should be something that's universally known because as we will talk about next time the speed of light is one of those things that everybody in the universe should be able to agree on <coughs> just like the charge of an electron Right? An electron will have the same charge whether it's here or in the Andromeda galaxy. The speed of light will have the same value whether it's measured on our planet spinning around our sun in 365 days or on some other planet spinning around a different star perhaps in a matter of hours. Perhaps it's moving much faster some other planet. But they will still agree that the speed of light is the same as our speed of light. We can do the same kind of thing with other constants that dictate the natural or fundamental interactions in our universe. We can set the uh, gravitational constant which describes the strength of gravity for a given mass or for all masses. Um, we can set that constant equal to one and we can do useful calculations and useful physics by assuming that. We can do a similar thing for the electrostatic constant that specifies the strength of interaction between two charged particles. We can do the same thing for uh, Planck's constant for quantum phenomena. It's hard to display quantum phenomena, so I have a picture of Schrodinger's kitten here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about quantum mechanics in a couple of months and uh, talk about how measurement is a very tricky business when you're dealing with quantum mechanics. But there's a numeric constant that shows up again and again when dealing with quantum mechanics and we could also potentially set that value to one. When we do that for many of our equations, many of our terms in science, then other units um, become just percentages, right? What percent of the speed of light? What percent of the fundamental unit of attraction of gravity? What percent of the fundamental unit of charge? Now, charge is particularly interesting because charges come in discrete units. When you have 
a mass, you have a ball or a planet or a feather, it makes sense that that mass can take on a fairly large continuum of values. As far as we know, there's no discrete quantification of mass, uh, with a couple of qualifications about Planck mass and whatnot. But charge very clearly comes in discrete units. You can never have less than one electron's worth of charge visible to you in, in, in uh, any interaction. So every charge that we measure in the universe is always some multiple of that fundamental unit of charge. And by recognizing that nature is telling us what some of these fundamental things are, it's telling us what the fundamental speed is, it's the speed of light. It's telling us what the fundamental charge is, it's the charge on an electron, etc. That provides us a vocabulary for doing science in a fairly agnostic way, uh, independent of our cultural, historical, or civilization biases. We could also potentially, I apologize, we could also poten uh, potentially set some of our mathematical constants equal to, uh, um, uh, to one with strange uh, implications in terms of measuring things. Um, but doing, doing these kinds of things allows us to uh, communicate with aliens. I'm sorry, I misspoke here. We don't set these equal to one. We recognize that these values, pi and e, etc., have the same value <coughs> at other places in the universe. So that's a case where we don't set them to one, but we do recognize that these fundamental values are the same fundamental values that would be measured by these fellows. Scott, didn't, didn't ancient civilizations uh, have natural measures, units of measure anyway? I mean, long before we got scientific mm -hmm. and annotation and writing and so forth, they measured everything in terms of what was real, in terms of the universe, right? Yeah, so how it... How many moons, how many, how this, how that, it always refers to nature. Yeah, that, an excellent distinction. Thank you for raising that. So when I talk about natural units, I'm not talking about the natural length of the forearm to measure cubits or the natural length of the foot to measure feet. Right? Uh, I'm not talking about the period it takes for the Earth to rotate on its axis to measure a day right? and splitting that into 24 hours. That's not what I mean when I talk about natural units, although those are derived from nature. They're also derived from accidents of nature. Our foot happens to be this long. Our earth happens to rotate at a particular speed. So those are highly context dependent. They are based upon things we apprehend about nature, but they're not fundamental or special to, or, I'm sorry, they are completely special to our historical coincidences. The natural units I was talking about on the prior slide, like setting the speed of light equal to one, Nobody anywhere in the universe will ever measure a different speed of light than we measure. And by setting it equal to one, that enables us to, to notate every other speed as some percentage of the speed of light. So that's the natural unit of measure. It's the one that nature says, this makes sense for um, uh, divorcing the concept of measurement of speed from some historical accident. It doesn't matter what unit they express that in miles per second or rubles per blah blah. It doesn't matter because it's it's the same thing. Yeah, we do that already when we talk about light years. So light goes a distance of one light year. That's a unit of measure. It's the distance that a light beam will travel in empty space over the course of one year. Right? One of our years, though. Yes, but interestingly enough. It travels one light year in one year. Light also travels one light second in one second. Light travels one light decade in one, in one decade. Right. So interestingly enough, the mathematical expression of this is always one. One light year per year. One light second per second one light decade per decade. It's always one. The speed of light when we talk about light years is one. It's one unit of length for one unit of corresponding time. And that relationship between distance and time, which is a measure of speed, 
is inherently related to the inherent speed of light. <clears throat> well, let's talk about proxies. Some of you may have been here last year when I gave a talk about the science of dating. Um, that talk wasn't about how to hook up at a singles bar. It was specifically about how do we go about, <clears throat> pardon me, how do we go about measuring time? Time is a very tricky thing to measure. I've thought moderately hard about it. I haven't spent days thinking about it. But in the time that I've thought about time, I haven't been able to come up with an example of how we measure time directly. Everything I've thought of, and perhaps you can, do, uh, you can go further than I, <clears throat> but everything I've thought of about time entails measuring some proxy for time. When we're measuring time through an hourglass, we're using the height of the sand or the volume of sand in that glass to measure time. When we use a clock, a ticking analog clock to measure time, we're using the position and motion of the hands around the clock to measure time. There are, there are no ways that I've encountered where we measure time directly. We're always measuring time's impact on something by virtue of motion or distance. So when we're talking about measuring time, we're really typically talking about measuring some proxy. So here's a lady standing next to layers of rock and you may recall from my talk about the science of dating that those layers are laid down at varying rates. So it's not necessarily true that from this white layer to this red layer is five years because those little layers in between. Maybe it's a million years and maybe a similar distance up here is 10 million years. The rate of deposition for different sediments and different, and different contexts in nature may vary. But we can still use things related to nature's clock. And some of the best clocks that we know of in nature are atomic processes, specifically nuclear decay. As far as we've been able to tell, nuclear decay happens at the same rate throughout the history of the universe for a given material. And that has opened up an immense vista for being able to measure time and correlate different measures of time, whether it's layers in sediment or layers in an ice core or rings in a tree. We can use this uh, atomic decay dating to, uh, to, to, uh, as a natural uh, point of reference for measuring many other times. Time can also be a proxy for distance laser and sonar rangefinders. When you use a laser rangefinder, it sends out a pulse of light to an object and that pulse bounces back. Well, how does the rangefinder range know how far that is, right? Does it, does it thread out um, um, some kind of tape measure and then reel it back in, which is what we can do without light? No, of course it measures the time it takes for the light to get from one point back to the other. So there, again, we're using time as a proxy for measuring distance. Right? If it takes one second for light to go to a target and come back, then we know that it's 186,000 miles away. If it takes one and a half seconds, we know that it's as far away as the moon. So we can use time as a proxy for distance. We can use spring compression as a proxy for mass in one of these devices. It's a bathroom scale. We've got kitchen scales. We've got other ways of using one phenomena, using one measure, say distance or compression or tension. We can use that as a proxy for measuring some other physical characteristic. Here's another one. This is a map of the distribution of different uh, tree types in the United States um, from 1960 to 1990. So we've got uh, the dark red is maple and beech and birch, trees associated typically with the, with the far north. And we've got oaks, which are the greens and the yellows. And then if we project the distribution of forests uh, into the future, 2070 through uh, 2100, by virtue of 
um, knowing that the climate is changing, then we can use this map of the distribution of forests as a proxy for telling us, well, the temperatures must be warmer up here. So nature provides us many opportunities to measure one thing uh, by virtue of measuring a different proxy. Light. <clears throat> In basic physics and astronomy, light is the ultimate proxy. I told you about a laser rangefinder, how you can use uh, the time it takes a laser beam to get to an object and bounce back to you as a mechanism for measuring distance. Well, light is the ultimate proxy. Um, here we've got spectra. This is for hydrogen. You see this bright line here? That bright line is a characteristic that will always show up when you, uh, um, let's say, heat up hydrogen. Hydrogen will always glow with this characteristic uh, set of colors, and most prominent will be these uh, bright lines here. We have a similar thing for helium and lithium and oxygen and carbon. You see that carbon has several different bright lines. And neon. If you remember, neon street lights are reddish orange. Well, look at all of the bright lines in the red, yellow, and orange part of the spectrum that is an inherent property of neon gas. So we can use the color of something. We can carefully analyze the light emitted by different atoms to understand what those atoms are. We know that there is hydrogen in the Andromeda galaxy because we can see this kind of light coming from the Andromeda galaxy. We don't have to go there and take a sample and bring it back to our laboratories. We know that the furthest galaxies visible, which are so distant that it would have taken light about 13 billion years or 12 billion years to reach them, we know that those distant galaxies also have hydrogen and helium and lithium and oxygen in them. So the fact that atomic composition can be seen, literally seen to be the same across the universe, tells us that we're, we're pretty safe in saying that many of the laws of nature that give rise to these, the way electrons behave in atoms, the weight of atoms and atomic particles, we have a pretty good idea for saying that all of those things are constant through space. But remember, those galaxies are 13 billion light years away, which means that the light that we're receiving from them was generated 13 billion years ago. So not only by looking at starlight do we have a lot of information about their atoms and the fact that their atoms weigh the same and electrically behave the same as atoms on our planet far away, but they also behave the same as the atoms on our planet further away in time. 13 billion years later. So this, just by virtue of looking at the light of stars, we can, we can lead to astonishing conclusions about the constancy of the laws of science across the universe. In science fiction stories or in the speculations of people who don't know these, these facts, you may hear speculation like, well, maybe the laws of nature are different on Andromeda than they are here. Maybe there's a planet where electricity behaves differently than it behaves here. This puts the fiction in those speculations because we can measure these things across vast time and space. We can also use light as a proxy for measuring speed. So here is, um, I don't know, let's say this is oxygen. This may be an oxygen spectra of an of a oxygen uh, atom at rest, and as, as you move uh, toward, relatively toward this, then these spectral lines will be shifted a little bit towards the blue end of the spectrum, and as you move away from it, it'll be shifted a little towards the red end of the spectrum. You can see that these lines don't quite line up. There's a little shift, and that's called the red shift or the blue shift. So we can recognize, let's say that this is uh, oxygen here on Earth, but when we look up at the stars, we may see a star that has a very similar pattern of lines, but it's shifted within the spectrum. What does that tell us about that star? It's moving. Right. 
So we can use light, not just in terms of bouncing it off of those stars, like a radar gun, but we can use the inherent property of the light that we get from those stars to tell us how fast they're moving. That's amazing. These things are quintillions of miles away, and we get a lot of information about what comprises them in terms of their uh, atoms and how they're moving just by looking at their light. Light can also tell us mo uh, molecular composition. Um, this is molecular hydrogen. This, this is regular hydrogen. Remember how simple our spectrum of hydrogen was on that prior uh, view? It's just a couple of lines. Well, if you combine two hydrogen atoms together and make a molecule of hydrogen, the spectrum becomes a lot more complicated. But it's still distinct to a hydrogen molecule. And we can similarly derive or measure these spectrums from many other molecules. And using this mechanism, we can look at something like the Orion Nebula and know that it has organic molecules in it. We don't have to go there and open a vial and capture some molecules and bring them back to Earth. We can use the inherent properties of light to recognize that there are organic molecules in space. And how wonderful is that? Right? They're called organic molecules because they entail carbon as one of their constituents. But we've seen relatively complex organic molecules in space. Now these aren't at all to be presumed to be the molecules emitted by or, or entailed in the products of life. Right? You don't need a living creature to have methane. And we do measure methane in the stars. In fact, we measure methane on Mars. But we need to have organic molecules to even have the possibility of life. And I believe the first lecture I'll be giving next year, I think it's in uh, September, is going to be how can organic molecules turn into life. It's something called abiogenesis. And we'll be talking about that. But for today's purposes, just recognizing that we can detect organic molecules far away in the cosmos is a very interesting thing. We can also use light to measure temperature. People uh, in here may be uh, familiar with photography, either analog photography or digital photography, and you've got something on your camera called white balance. What does white balance mean? White balance is a way of characterizing the color of the ambient light around you, and that's related to temperature. So you'll notice that the light in this room has a nice warm kind of orangish red cast to it. So the light in this room is probably around 3,000 degrees. And if you have a camera and you set it to auto white balance, then it'll recognize that the light in this room is about 3,000 degrees and it'll compensate for that when calculating its color balance. The sun is about 5,000 degrees. It's a very neutral, um, almost white color. So that's noon daylight is about 5,000 degrees. So we can use light to tell us the temperature of things. We can use it to tell the composition, the speed, the temperature. We can also use light to detect magnetic fields, right? If you put an atom, this happens to be, it looks like zinc, if you put atom of zinc in a magnetic field, then its spectral line, its characteristic color, will split into three closely spaced colors. That only happens in a magnetic field. So we can detect magnetic fields associated with stars or regions in space by detecting the influence of that magnetic field on the spectral line. We can also use light to detect gravity. There's a couple of ways for that. Um, <clears throat> gravity also imparts to light a kind of redshift just like speed does. I'm not going to go into details now, but because gravity causes a redshift, we can measure the light emitted near an exceptionally heavy object and detect that redshift. Now here's an interesting thing. Gravitational redshift happens to all light. And if you remember, microwave, radio waves, ultraviolet, x-rays, those are all types of light. And our global positioning system, the satellites that whiz around our planet, emit radio waves. If we did not take into account the fact that 
gravity causes a redshift in that radio wave as it goes from a satellite to the ground, then our GPS signals would be off by many meters. So we have to take that into account, the fact that gravity slows down light um, and redshifts the spectrum. Uh, another way that gravity influences light, you've heard of gravitational lensing, perhaps, or if you put a heavy thing in front of a, um, the path of light coming from a galaxy or a star, then that light from that most distant galaxy or star could bend around the heavy thing, and you can actually get a lensing phenomena in space. Again, all of that is told to us by light. Light is a wonderful and the ultimate proxy. And finally, there's been some talk over the past summer, uh, it's still being hotly debated whether light allows us to measure gravity waves in the infant universe. Um, one of the aspects of light that can be measured is its polarization. And by measuring polarization in the cosmic microwave background radiation, we talked about that CMB in the uh, first lecture about the Big Bang. By measuring the polarization of light, which is very technically challenging, the, the signal is so weak um, that it's, it's exceptionally challenging. And some people think that detecting this signal is more detecting noise than a real signal. But if, in fact, there is a particular kind of polarization in the light from when the universe was very young and hot, that polarization could quite clearly and cleverly be explained by the presence of gravity waves. Symmetry. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, thank you very much. The discussion of gravity uh, made me wonder: Is there some way that light could help anticipate earthquakes or volcanoes? Because if the if the Earth is doing something different chemically, would light pick that up? Well, um, yes and no. So there are. When I talk about the science of dating. One of the things that um, I, I found during my research of that is that the light, the fluorescent light that you can get from minerals, can have a lot to do with the temperature or pressure under which that mineral exists. Or it can also be affected by the history of pressure and temperature of a particular mineral. So we can use light to probe the history or the, the current stressors or temperatures that are impacting the crystal arrangement of different minerals in the earth. But unfortunately, most of the minerals in the earth are opaque. So getting light from inside a fault and measuring the stress in that fault by virtue of measuring the light signature within that um, uh, tectonic fault uh, would probably be impractical. Um, the other thing that you can do with light is by virtue of location. Um, <clears throat> I read a book, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, um, I apologize, but I read a book last summer that talked about measuring the height of uh, a Mount Everest. And Mount Everest is uplifting because uh, Hindu subcontinent or the uh, Indian subcontinent is crashing into the Asian continent. And that smashing is happening at a very slow speed, but it's causing the Himalayas to lift up over time. And one of the ways they've used to measure the height of Mount Everest is by bouncing a light beam off of a mirror placed on Mount Everest. So you can measure the movements of Earth by virtue of light beams, and we do that. And by the way, the book was about the height of Everest is changing all the time, slowly, but it's changing. So when you ask, what is the height of Mount Everest, do you mean today? Or do you mean yesterday? Right? How many decimal points do you want that? Right? It's a good book. I can't remember the title. I apologize. Um, I think I have my Kindle with me. I could look it up. Um, so constant measurements. So I talked about how we can measure things that are constant across time. We know that the electrical properties of atoms are constant across time and space. Well, there's a theorem that says because physical phenomena are the same across time, we know that energy is conserved. And uh, we'll talk about this in more depth when I have the symmetry discussion uh, in a few months. Um, constants across space, 
conserve momentum. Constants that don't change as you rotate about a point Im implies the conservation of angular momentum. Um, if you combine space and time into a single entity, which Einstein does with relativity, then you can see that you've got uh, constants through space and time, and that in an indirect way leads to the notion of the conservation of charge. There's something conserved, let's say for, for illustrative purposes, let's say the speed of light is conserved, it's the same everywhere. By virtue of that being conserved and symmetrical no matter where you are, that gives rise to the necessity for a physical parameter that is also conserved, and that parameter is charge. And that also gets into, remember last time in the lecture I was talking about the imaginary number, I? One of the things you can do with relativity, and we'll talk about this next month, is you can use this idea of imaginary numbers to view relativistic phenomena as being a rotation in a complex plane from a real number to an imaginary number and back again. And we'll talk about that. And one of the reasons I'm going to stress that in that lecture is because it involves symmetry. Um, you can also have symmetry in a mirror. If you swap plus x for minus x, or, or plus y for minus y, or plus time for minus time, if you swap any of these single variables in um, natural phenomena, you end up with something that is generally conserved. And that thing is called parity. Some of you who keep up with science articles may have heard something called parity violations in particle physics. Parity means you're swapping a plus for a minus. Remember we talked about that in the math talk too, where you can flip-flop between plus and minus? So that kind of mathematics is entailed in a certain symmetry. Um, and then there's a couple more that are going to be more difficult to explain, and I'll treat them more fully in a couple months when I talk about symmetry theories. There's something conserved called weak isospin, and that gives rise to the weak nuclear force. And then there's rotations in something called flavor space. I apologize, physicists once again chose very interesting names for some of these things. Um, there are rotations in flavor space, a space described mathematically by this notation, and that gives rise to the strong force. I don't expect um, you to come away with an understanding of what I mean by these things. I'll go into more detail about these in the spring. So apprehending what the world displays is what we do when we measure the world. We can do it through our senses. We can do it through our devices. Evidence presented to our senses and our devices allows us to understand properties of nature. Some things are measured not by virtue of themselves, but their impact on other things. You can not measure an electric field directly. In order to measure the influence of, a, of an electric force, you have to have a test particle. You have to have an electron. You have to have something charged that responds to this field. So you can never directly measure an electric field. Isn't that interesting? You need a charged particle, a proxy, to measure it. Um, apprehending the world leads to comprehending the world. And that's the theme of today's talk, that by measuring the world carefully, by recognizing that there are measurements that vary from place to place, and that there are measurements that are the same across space and time, allows us to better comprehend the world. Even to the point of comprehending things that are surprising, like the strong nuclear force or relativity. And in many cases, what we measure is not what we expect. <clears throat> if you calculate the way the stars in a galaxy should whirl about its center, you can calculate that pretty clearly, and it gives a distribution of velocities as you go outward from the center of the galaxy. And yet, if you measure the actual speeds of stars around the central hub of the galaxy, and recall that we can do that because of the Doppler shift, we can see the changes in the light, coming from these stars that allows us to characterize their speed. What we calculate based upon gravity and gravitational dynamics is much different than what we actually see. It was this fact that led a lady back in the uh, 1920s to postulate that uh, there was more mass available to galaxies than we see. And that's dark matter. Some of you have heard of dark matter. So again, by carefully measuring the universe, we can surprise ourselves with interesting 
Um, interesting conclusion. That is exciting. Let's see. Uh, where are we heading? January, we'll talk about relativity. February, quantum mechanics. March, forces of nature and symmetry theories. April, particle physics. And in May, we will talk about cosmology, wrapping up this year's talks. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah. I have two. Okay. One, as time goes on, we seem to be discovering more constants. Red, the list, right? And as science progresses, um, we keep adding the list. Pretty slowly, but right. occasionally. Okay. The question is, have we ever disproved it? So you get constants. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so remember I talked about the constant that is entailed in measuring the strength of the electric force? There's a similar constant entailed in measuring the, the force of magnetism. It turns out that both of those constants are derivable from the speed of light and vice versa. So these three, what we thought were very distinct constants, uh, the magnetic coupling constant, the electric coupling constant, and the speed of light, we, think that we initially thought that these were three completely unrelated phenomena. It turns out that they're all aspects of a single underlying property of space-time. So we refine our ability to measure constants to ever greater and greater precision. That's one way that we change our knowledge of the constants. And the other way is that we sometimes find that what we thought were distinct phenomena are actually unified. And uh, I'll talk about that in particle physics where electromagnetism so first of all, electricity and magnetism are aspects of the same thing. That was surprising, right? What does a bar magnet have to do with somebody's hair standing up because of an electric charge? Unifying electricity and magnetism was a great, um, a great discovery of the, of the 19th century. Well, in the 20th century, they unified electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force. It's called the electroweak theory. So what we thought were completely distinct and separate aspects of nature are manifestations of a simple, single underlying phenomenon. And when you hear people talking about the grand unified theory of nature, if you saw the movie about Stephen Hawking, he said he wanted to write one equation that described the universe, what we're really talking about is understanding an ever bigger way, an ever better way to chunk together our knowledge about nature so that everything is related implicitly and explicitly to each other thing. So that you could potentially, just like taking the constant for magnetism and electricity and the speed of light and the constants that describe the weak nuclear force and bundling them all up under one phenomena, we'd like to be able to do that with every constant of nature and show that they are necessarily an aspect of some single property of our universe. The second question was, what about the theory or idea that um, anytime you observe something, you change it? Yeah, we'll talk about that during our quantum mechanics lecture. Okay. And that generally only applies in any, any kind of conceivable, practical way. The notion that when you measure something, you change it, really only applies if you're measuring really tiny things. If you measure the location of a bus with a tennis ball by bouncing a tennis ball off of it, you're not going to change the property of that bus. Right? So when you talk about seeing a thing changes a thing. Some people would like you to believe that you can use that idea in medicine or you can use that idea for wishful thinking, that you can make your dreams come true if you measure something differently or you wish for some different result. <laughs> Physics doesn't allow for any of that quantum nonsense. Right? What happens with science is that if you measure a very tiny, a very small <coughs> phenomena in a very delicate way, you can't help but disturb the thing you're measuring. But that, that kind of incredibly small disturbance is lost in the noise once we start measuring large things like a molecule. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. You said that uh, the, from the Big Bang, uh, we can see it happened 13 billion years ago. Uh, is this uh, uh, just for the Earth or if? We were located on a different, in a different part of the universe, so that would be different then or not? Um, that's a really good question, and that brings into, into uh, play ideas about relativity. Um, my, uh, my Big Bang 
talk, which I will be putting the video up on, I've, I've said a couple times there were some technical difficulties. That was the first video I recorded. I will put the Big Bang talk up on YouTube, probably in January when I get through the holiday season and have more time. But one of the things about the Big Bang is that it happened everywhere in space. And there's no particular vantage point in space that would be um, significantly different in terms of the way they measure reality compared to any other space in terms of measuring the distances and time scales entailed in the Big Bang. All the particles that were emitted when the Big Bang heated space and caused all this soup of plasma to be created, all of that stuff was isotropic, was the same temperature and the same density. So there's not likely to be a special place in our universe where um, ever since the Big Bang, that cluster of molecules has been moving so incredibly rapidly that compared to the way the rest of the universe measures the time since the Big Bang, their time will be different through relativity. It's very likely that all the places in space will have measured the same time and distance to the Big Bang. Yeah. Yes, um, I'm a nurse and I'm into natural healing. And you mentioned something about electromagnetic um, phenomena. Mm -hmm. Now, do you know anything or believe in the EMF sensitivity of certain people? Um, a small yes and a big no. The small yes is there have been scientific experiments that show that um, humans may have a latent ability to detect magnetic fields, just like it's been proved that birds have the ability to detect magnetic fields. In fact, there's a deposit of minerals in the skull, the forehead of birds, that is implicated in their ability to orient on a magnetic field. It may be that's kind of inconclusive whether or not humans have a residual similar ability to at least detect a magnetic field. But in the larger context, uh, and, and you can detect an electric field when your hair stands on end, right? But in the larger context of it having a impact on the biochemistry of an organism, it's pretty unlikely um, and no rigorous double-blind scientific uh, experiment that I'm aware of has ever shown that putting on a magnetic bracelet or um, subjecting someone to a minor magnetic or electric field has any kind of physiological effect. Um, there, are, there are cases with electric eels and, where, and whatnot where electricity or magnetism is implicated in the biology of the creature, but it doesn't seem to have any bearing to what science has been able to measure about human physiology. I know it's still an ongoing research, right? Um, yes, there are still some people looking for the phenomena, but people who have looked in the past haven't found anything. Yes? We were talking about that. Doesn't your body have a magnet? Yes. Or a hemoglobin? So you could increase blood flow in the part of the body? Yeah, that's what MRIs magnetic resonance imaging do they um, I haven't done the calculation myself but my guess is you could look it up on the internet and see that the actual force imparted deviates your blood cells the, the small amount of iron in the hemoglobin of your red blood cells and if you put a strong magnet on your wrist, you can probably calculate how much those red blood cells will deviate from their trajectory as they're compelled along by the pressure in your veins. And my suspicion, I don't know this for certain, but my suspicion is, is that if you calculate that out, it'll be a very trivial effect compared to the impelling force of your blood pressure. What was the question? Um, putting a magnet on you might redirect your blood flow because blood has iron in it. Um, I suspect, I'm not an expert in this, I haven't done the calculation myself, but I suspect that if that were true, we'd see magnets used all over the place by physicians. It would be widely implemented anytime we had an injury. I suspect that if you were to calculate the magnetic force on a red blood cell by virtue of a magnet placed on you, it would be trivial compared to the force of the blood pressure pushing it along in its normal trajectory. The force of an MRI. 
Yeah, if that were true, yeah, because the strength of the right. magnetic field in an MRI is... I mean, an MRI is about a million times stronger than a rare earth magnet. Yeah, so your blood would fly out of your body. <laughs> it's a good point. Thank you very much. What was this point? That if, if, the, if, if a magnetic bracelet were enough to affect the blood, the millions of times stronger MRI if, would just rip the blood out of your body. And that's not what happened. Right. There would be Dave's suit all over the inside of the MRI that I had last year. Hey, can you get another MRI suit, please? That's a good point. No, you might not see it. Yes. But exposure to x-rays can clearly cause over Yes. Can clearly That's cause problems, problems with your bio tissue. Right. The, that's a different phenomenon. That's because x-rays are what's called ionizing radiation. The energy in an x-ray is so high that it can literally interfere with the organic chemistry in your body. Those chemical bonds that um, would typically be there will be affected by the huge amount of energy imparted over a tiny distance by an x-ray. That's not going to happen with a, with a radio wave or a cellular antenna wave. Yeah, that's the differentiating factor is, is it ionizing or non-ionizing? If it's non-ionizing, that means by definition it cannot knock pieces off. If it's ionizing, by definition, it can knock pieces off. And the more pieces it knocks off, the more chance you have a bad stuff happening. Yeah. Yep. So the, the non-ionizing ones are like laptop, computers, cell phones. Wi-Fi signals, yeah. FM they, radio transmissions. They are proven to the extent of science's capability to prove to be non-ionizing. Electric blankets. Right. Yes, ma'am. What is the energy then that we hear the crackling of the high power lines when they're yeah. fairly isolated from the community? But I hear people have been disturbed that that energy emission has caused health problems. Yeah, I I don't. It's not it's not anything I've studied explicitly, but I do know that the high uh, high current and high voltage they are called high voltage lines are much higher than twelve than than uh, one hundred and twenty volts. Um, that very high voltage can cause local um, sparks, essentially. Um, like if you're rubbing your feet on the carpet and you touch a doorknob, you get a momentary spark. Depending upon the humidity, uh, depending upon the construction of the tower and how well it's insulated, you can get um, electrical interactions with the air, and that's what causes sound. Um, I don't know. From what I remember reading in some of the skeptic material I read, there's nothing definitive that living Living underneath, if you were to set up your house underneath a high tension wire, um, there's nothing definitive that that would be harmful to you. Um, But there may be something there. I'm not certain. Yeah. Yeah, see, that's the thing. There's a lot of, there's still a lot of unknown that science has not, you know, dealt with or goes through it. And and like, you know, when you talk about EMF, um, I know that there are people sensitive to it, and there are people that are not. You know, there are mm-hmm. people that sh- they don't even have any problem with it. But so it's like I'm, re- I'm very curious about uh, you know like future discoveries about that. So one of the one of the things that's that's, that's interesting, interesting to me about those kinds of things you've heard of you've heard of Reiki therapy where you wave your hands over somebody and you impart your energy. Well, I, I applaud your skepticism because what is often entailed in those kinds of phenomena is that if you have somebody who walks up to you and says, I'm going to make you feel better. You should feel the warmth coming out of my body. You should start breathing more easily. You should start to feel the blood flowing more easily. I'm giving all kinds of really powerful suggestions to that person about how they should feel. Right? And science tries to be very careful about not biasing people. Um, so when you say that you know people who react to EMF fields, it may be that if you ask them if they can sense the field that you know is there, they will say yes. But if you try to be scientific about it and say, can you sense the field that I know is there, when you're actually tricking them, you know there is no field there, they're likely to still say yes. Oh, yes, I can feel that. So our ability to be emotionally biased um, and to pick up on signals that other people send us, emotional signals, 
our ability to react to placebo effects uh, from medicine or phenomena is so high that it's really hard sometimes to sort out what's medically valid from non. If you look at your uh, description, if you look at the uh, answer and the placebo effect, it's about a third in the studies. So one of the more common things that's mentioned when they're doing EMF studies is they'll put, you know, say, a Wi-Fi router in a room next to somebody and say, are you feeling the effects of this router? Um, and they'll say yes. And in half of the instances, the Wi-Fi router is not plugged in, is not turned on. Mm -hmm. And in the other half, it will be turned on. And what you would expect to see is a statistically higher frequency of people saying that they can te feel it when it's turned on. And yet that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's science can help us. Random noise. Science can help us distinguish between real versus imagined claims. And, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with the integrity of the people making the claims. A Reiki practitioner may believe inherently that they're doing something good and beneficial for humanity. They may not be trying to cheat anybody out of money when they charge $10 for a session. But when science looks at that and they find no causal phenomena that is relevant, then that's why... I personally am doing this series of lectures is that hopefully a better understanding of fundamental science can help us all separate the wheat from the chaff, separate the signal from the noise, understand better what's possible about reality. If you have more you'd like to discuss with me, maybe we can talk afterwards. Is there anyone else that has any questions? Yes. With regard to the power lines, that was studied by the <coughs> National Academy of Sciences Natural Research uh, Group back in Chicago and found nothing. Okay, thank you for so that. It's, you it out, sure it's, it's yeah. Before you let everybody walk away, there will be a foodie thing afterwards? Oh yeah, we're going to go um, at, at least, least at least three of us, and uh, as, as many, many as, as we want. want. We're going to go to, uh, what was it, Tom and Eddie's? Just a block and a half down here, um, a little sandwich shop for lunch if people would like to join us. Just so uh, we can congregate there in the hall afterwards. You're welcome to continue the discussion. Any, you, uh, someone else had a question? Thank you. Yes. Tonight at seven there will be a solstice program here at the church, and anybody who is interested in sort of a eclectic um, <clears throat> celebration of community is welcome to come to that. You guys wearing costumes? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I love it. We come tonight. I know in the past it has been a warm and fuzzy and if you would like to wear a costume, I'm sure nobody is. I just want to know what to expect, that's all. Well, thank you all for coming again today. We'll see you next time for a relatively.
Good morning, everyone. Happy winter solstice. All right, um, let me see. I don't want to embarrass anyone or call anyone out. Would you, would you like me to, to explain what a winter solstice is, or does everyone pretty much have a clear idea? Yeah. So the winter solstice is the, uh, um, you know, the earth is tilted at about 23 and a half degrees on its axis. And as it moves around the sun, that makes the sun appear to slowly move from north to south and back again over the course of a year. As the sun is here and the earth sometimes points the northern hemisphere towards it and sometimes points the northern hemisphere away from the sun. The winter solstice is that point when the sun reaches the furthest point south. So it's when we're directly pointed away from the sun. <laughs> And it also happens to be the shortest daylight of the year from here on out. Uh, we're climbing back uphill towards the summer solstice when we'll go downhill again. <coughs> so that's what the solstice is. That's today. The, it happens at a particular time during the day. And I don't recall what that time is. Something like... Uh, 323 Eastern. Thank you very much. <laughs> and this means pause or stand still. So solstice. Sun still. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome to Science Sunday. As I anticipated, the turnout is relatively light today. I've got one more person to add. There we go. This is, uh, this is deceptive.